All right, chapter one, communication disorders. Chances are someone you know has a communication disorder. How would your life differ if you had a communication disorder? Um, what if you woke up tomorrow and you stuttered, or you woke up tomorrow and had a voice disorder or a language disorder, a central auditory processing disorder, right? What if, what if you know, heaven forbid, you, you had a stroke today or you got into a, a car accident, right? How would that communication disorder make your life different? On the flip side, if you currently have a communication disorder, how would your life change if you did not have the disorder? If you woke up tomorrow and you no longer stuttered, no longer had a language disorder, had a voice disorder, had a hearing disorder, had a central auditory processing disorder, what would be different if you didn't have those things? Would it be great? Would you feel like you lost a part of yourself? Would it be disorienting? Um, communication has such a profound impact on ourselves, our lives, um, that it can really change us um, for the better and sometimes for the worse to have a communication disorder. All right. So before we talk about disorders, right, we got to talk about what is communication. Um, there are a couple different definitions to care, share, and connect with each other. All right, so the idea of connecting with somebody or multiple people. The transmission of thoughts or feelings from the mind of a speaker to the mind of a listener. Right, so we've got at least two people involved here. We've got to have at least someone transmitting and somebody receiving. All means by which information is transmitted between a sender and a receiver. So you've got to have at least two people, sometimes a lot. Um, and it's a way of connecting and sharing information with each other. Right? We've got three main communication purposes to request, to reject, and to comment. Right? To request is, can I have that? Um, I want that. Give that to me, please. To reject, I don't want that. Uh, I don't think that's a good idea. I don't think we should do that. I really disagree with you. And everything else is pretty much a comment. We've got to have at least one sender and one receiver of information, right? Sometimes we can have a lot of people talking together, but you've got to have at least one of each to have communication. Um, communi communication processes, we've got to have formulation, transmission, reception, and comprehension. Formulation is the organization of one's thoughts or ideas. Transmission is conveying ideas to another, and this can be through speaking, through sign language, through gesturing, through writing. We've got to have reception, right? We've got to be able to receive the information. So we've either got to have hearing or vision or something to help us receive it. And then finally, we've got to have comprehension, right? We've got to have some ability to understand and organize that message. So if I'm speaking in English and only know English, and the person I'm talking to only speaks Spanish and only knows Spanish, there's no comprehension, right? I've had an idea. I've transmitted it. He's received it. But there's no comprehension going on because um, you can't understand and organize a language you don't know. All right, so and basically we'll be talking about human communication, right? So the social interaction among people and the idea that communication impacts people, right? That it makes a change in someone, either their understanding or what they're going to actually do. Um, one thing I asked you for is can you tell me in your discussion question, um, do animals communicate and how do they communicate? So how have you seen maybe one of your pets communicate or other animals? How do animals communicate? All right. So successful communication, right, requires a sender. It requires a shared symbolic system, right? So both of us have to speak the same language, whether that's English, whether that's sign language, no matter what it is, right, the two people have to have a shared symbolic system. You've got to have a receiver, 
And then there's also got to be feedback. Um, you've got to understand that you're being heard. So this is information provided from the receiver to the sender that says, yes, I got it. All right. So linguistic feedback is some kind of words or something verbal, vocal, saying, uh-huh, yes, I got it. I don't understand. What are you talking about? Right. So some kind of feedback linguistically. Non-linguistic feedback, right? If you're shaking your head up and down as I'm talking, right, I know you're listening to me. Um, if you're watching TV and I'm talking and you're not talking to me and you're not nodding your head up and down, I really don't know if you've understood what I've said. Finally, there's paralinguistic feedback, which it's really part of linguistic feedback, right? So if I ask you if you understand what I'm saying and you say yes, I know you're understanding what I'm saying. If I ask you if you understand what I'm saying and you say yeah, I know you don't understand what I'm saying. You said yeah, but because of the paralinguistic aspects, the pitch rise, things like that, I know, okay, you don't know what I'm saying. All right, and that's a really important part. Um, effective communication, according to Grice, um, has really four principles. The principle of quantity, right? So you've got to give just the right amount of information. If you give me too little information, I might not understand you. If you give me too much information, I'm going to get confused and not understand you. It's got to be just right. The principle of quality, um, you're expected to be accurate and truthful. So if you're someone that lies to me all the time, we're not going to communicate anymore because you might talk, but I'm not going to believe what you're saying. So there's actually no communication going on. There's the principle of relevance, right? We're able to maintain the topic at hand. Um, so if you're trying to ask me a question about the chapter one material, and I start telling you a story about my grandfather, that's not relevant. It's not helpful. It doesn't, it doesn't improve communication. It doesn't move our conversation forward at all. Um, and then finally, there's the principle of manner. Um, are we going at the right pace? Are we taking pauses? Are we going too fast, too slow, too loud, too quiet? Um, is the eye contact what would normally be expected? So, you know, how are you communicating um, can make it easier to communicate. All right, so language, speech, and hearing are really the essential ingredients of human communication, right? Those three factors. They're used for the formulation, transmission, reception, and comprehension of information. So let's talk about language first. It's the biggest. The cognitive process by which we formulate ideas and thoughts. It's a rule-based system of symbols and codes used to communicate. And I think this is one thing that people don't always realize is how actually rule-based it really is that everything you say and everything you write is really rule-based. You're putting the words in a particular order, in a particular way, um, and that right, we always have to call a chair a chair. I can't call a chair a soda. Um, right, we have to call things the same thing every time and put them in a rule-based order, or it doesn't make sense. It's a form of social behavior shaped and maintained by a verbal community. Right, so throughout your life, you've been given feedback where people understand you they don't understand you. Maybe they don't like what you're saying. They don't like how you're saying it, right? So your language has really been shaped and maintained by your listeners throughout your life. And remember that language can be oral or non-oral. It can be signed. It can be written as well as spoken. Language is a socially shared code that uses a conventional system of arbitrary symbols, right? Everything we say is totally arbitrary. We call a chair a chair just because someone once did a thousand years ago, right? There's no real reason for that. And we put words in an order, in an exact order, just because we do, right? In English, we usually put the... Um, adjective before the noun. In Spanish, often the adjective goes after the noun. There's no real reason. We just do it. 
it's what we do. Um, it's an arbitrary symbols and really arbitrary order to represent ideas about the world that are meaningful to self and others. Expressive language is language that is produced. It can be spoken, signed, written. Receptive language is language that is understood, listening, and comprehending. Language is universal, right? Every society, every human society in the world uses language. It's species specific, so only humans use language, right? Animals can communicate with each other, but they don't have specific rules and they don't have symbols. And this is a biggie. Language is decontextualized, right? I can tell you a story about my childhood, right? Your cat can't do that. It can't do that with you. It can't do that with other cats as far as we know, right? Your cat can't tell another cat, you know, wow, wasn't Thursday great? Didn't we have a good time Thursday? No, right? Animals can communicate about what's directly in front of them, how they're feeling, what they're hearing, um, whether they feel safe, whether they feel scared, whether they're hungry, whether they're angry, whether they're happy, right? But they can't tell you about, you know what, how about on Tuesday we go to the park, right? They can't do that. Um, Language is also productive, right? There's a reason, hopefully, why we're using language, right? We're going to get someone else to do something or to think about something in a different way. And language is also learned amazingly quickly by young children. Um, children can hear a word one time, and then they can use it on their own correctly. It's completely amazing and it's one of the ways that we know that human brains are really wired to learn language um, that right from the beginning we are set up to learn and use language um, linguistics is just the study of language the study of language structure and the rules of language um, and again, there are lots of rules about the order we speak, the words that we use, and all of these words and codes and symbols are all arbitrarily selected. We've just decided on them for no good reason. All right, it's all culturally based. All right, domains of language, rule-based. We've got content, refers to meaning. We've got form refers to organization and use refers to how language is used. All right, so we've got three big parts of language, content, right? So the meaning of what I'm saying, do you understand, does my language have meaning and value to you? Form, the organization, it's gotta be in the specific order, right, that we're talking in. If I said this presentation, but I put all the words in random order, it wouldn't mean anything, right? It's got to be in the correct order for our language in our culture. And use, how language is used is so important, right? I can, I can say all the right things, but if they're not in the right order and I don't use them correctly, it doesn't mean anything, right? If I walk up to you and meet you, and then 15 minutes later, after we've been talking, I say, hello, how are you, right? Whoa, that's really strange, right? I was supposed to do that at the beginning, not at the end, right? I, I didn't use that correctly. Um, I might have said the right words, but I need to use that. That hello needs to be used at the beginning of a conversation, not in the middle. All right, linguistics. So we've got three, so we just talked about form, content, and use. We've got three areas of language that deal with form, phonology, morphology, and syntax. One area that deals with content, with meaning, semantics, mostly vocabulary. And then one area, pragmatics, that deals with the use of language. So we're going to talk about those right now. Phonology is the study of speech sounds and sound patterns. Um, it examines the rules and processes that govern the patterns of sounds and sound systems, right? Words are just patterns of sounds that we have agreed are words. A phoneme is the smallest unit of sound. So speech is the production of meaningful phonemes. So let's take the word speech, right? 
and we've got four phonemes. S, p, e, ch, s, p, e, ch. Right, those four phonemes, those four sounds, meaningful sounds, are grouped together to produce a word. Okay, that's phonology. Morphology is the smallest meaningful units of language, right? So a phoneme is a meaningful sound, right? But s doesn't have any meaning. It only has meaning if it's part of a morpheme, right? So speech is one morpheme. It's a unit of language, and it's made up of four phonemes, right? Um, so let's take the word play, right? That is a morpheme. It has meaning all by itself, right? If I say the word play, you can have a vision in your head. You can see someone playing, right? So the base morpheme is play. It can have a prefix, a suffix. So a prefix would be replay, right? So I put re in front of play. The re is the prefix, and it, it links to that word play. I can have a suffix. I can put something after play. So I can put playing, plays, played, right? So there are things that can go after as well. All right, so play all by itself has meaning. So that is a free morpheme. All by itself, you've got meaning. Now, the bound morphemes are things like zzz, right? So if I say plays, that means something different than play. So that S at the end, which sounds like a zzz sound, right? The phoneme is actually zzz, even though the, the spelling would be an S, right? Plays is a bound morpheme. That zzz doesn't make any sense by itself. Playing, right, the ing has no meaning. It's not free, it's bound to others. So morphology is just the study of structures and the meaningful units of language. So that ing only has meaning if it's attached to a verb. It doesn't have meaning otherwise. Right. Syntax. Syntax is the arrangement of words to form meaningful sentences, right? So this is what we think about with grammar, right? The rules of language and Noam Chomsky in the 1950s, this is the first idea where we said language is innate. We are humans are wired to learn language. All humans, all cultures have language and um, it's very orderly, right? Words have to be in a specific order or it doesn't make sense. Um, so syntax is the order of words for meaningful sentences and just meaningful utterances, the rules of language. Semantics, we're really talking about vocabulary here, the study of meaning. So the referent theory of meaning, person, place, or thing. So things have to mean something. If a statement doesn't mean anything, it doesn't matter. Um, Chomsky, right, the guy we just talked about, he, um, came up with the sentence, colorless green ideas sleep furiously. That is grammatically correct. So from a syntax standpoint, everything's good. Words are in the right order, right? But it's meaningless. It doesn't actually mean anything. So because the semantics are messed up, right, it doesn't have meaning. And, and, and it doesn't have value. If language doesn't have, have meaning, it doesn't have value. Pragmatics are the study of the rules that govern the use of language. And language function, right? So like I said before, right? if I meet you, I say hi. You say hi. You say, what's your name? I tell you my name. I say, what's your name? You tell me your name. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Right? So it's, it's how we actually use the language. Um, and the idea is that words influence listeners, right? Saying is doing. So if I say, what's your name? You're going to tell me your name. And it, if we know each other and we see each other and say hi, one person's probably going to say, how are you? And I'm probably going to say, I'm fine. How are you? Right? So we have, we're influencing each other and w this is all rule-based. We're all carrying out sort of a rule-based function about how we talk to each other. All right, so that's language in a nutshell. Speech is a neuromuscular process that allows us to express language vocally. 
It's the precise activation of muscles in the respiration, phonation, and articulation systems that allow us to transmit language through speech. The building blocks of effective speech, we've got respiration, voice, articulation, and fluency. And we're going to talk about these. Respiration or breath stream. Speech always begins at exhalation, right? We don't talk at inhalation. We always talk at exhalation. An inability to reduce or maintain a strong, stable breath stream can result in disordered speech, right? So if I really have a hard time getting more than, you know, if I've got short, strangled, difficult breaths, right, that's going to really impede my communication ability. Voice. Voice quality is really important. A breathy, hoarse, broken, nasal voice can impact communication and the comfort of the speaker. Sometimes it can be really painful um, to have vocal folds that are either injured or maybe there's you know, something on them or something impacting them. They not only don't sound good, but it can be painful as well. Mm -hmm. Loudness, intensity, and pitch are also really important, right? So if I'm not able to speak at a very loud intensity, right, that's going to impact communication. If I did this entire presentation at a really high pitch, you'd probably have a really hard time paying attention to what I was saying. Articulation is the movement of the speech mechanism to produce the sounds of speech. So structures such as the soft palate, the tongue, and lips create the sounds of speech. All right, that's really important, right? So if I have breath and I have voicing, right, uh, that's all I've got. But it's actually the articulation, the way I shape my mouth, my soft palate, my tongue, my lips, the way I move my jaw, right? All of that actually create the sound of speech. The breath and the um, vocal folds just kind of create the power to do it. Um, so articulation is actually the way the sounds are produced. So your articulation changes what sounds you make. Fluency. Fluency really puts it all together. Um, the idea is that it's easy, smooth, flowing, effortless speech. Continuity is really important, right? So speech that has a lot of hesitations, interjections, repetitions, prolongations. Um, it's going to be effortful for the speaker to produce. It's going to be difficult for the listener to understand. Um, and people that talk really, really fast or really, really slow, that's going to impact communication as well. Finally, right, we've got hearing or audition, the perception of sound. And it's if we've got speech, we're talking about half of communication, right? You can talk, but if someone doesn't hear you, it doesn't matter. Hearing involves the awareness of sound, right? So, okay, I can hear something. And then, two, the ability to distinguish among sounds, right? If I just hear something, but I'm not able to hear the difference between speech sounds. I'm not going to be able to understand what you're saying. And then to be able to process that information really rapidly in real time as we're talking to each other. Um, acoustics is the study of sound and how sound gets from one place to another. So if you're sitting in front of me, right, there's a sound source vibration. So I'm going to use my vocal folds to make sound. Um, and my vocal folds are going to vibrate, and that's going to turn into the vibration of the air particles. Your ear then, those vibrating ear particles are going to go into your ear. You're going to sense that um, and hear it. And then your ear is going to send that into electrical signals that will shoot up your auditory nerve into your brain. And you're going to comprehend what I'm saying. Um, and once we get comprehension, then we get understanding of speech. Okay, and we're going to stop right there.